welcome to the fourth annual, or annual, this has been hilarious, the fourth town hall um, in the series of town halls that we, the Housing Coalition, have put together for you. Uh, tonight we have a panel. As you can see, there is a whole line of distinguished individuals who are the top of their field. They're ready to answer all of your fantastic questions. Um, my name is Emily Kundi. I am the co-chair for the Housing Coalition of Sheboygan County. Uh, you're used to Joan Abbey sitting up here, so sorry, you have to deal with me this evening. But um, we're really fortunate um, that the group has given us a huge list of questions. We've got 19 pre-listed questions. We will also give you an opportunity to share your questions with us as we move forward as well. Um, so I do believe we have a PowerPoint that has some information about the individuals on our panel this evening. Should we start with that? Oh, maybe we should just start with a little housekeeping. Uh, the Sheboygan County Housing Coalition meets the third Tuesday of every month at 9 a.m. I can't advertise that enough. Um, we are meeting virtually right now, so if you're interested in being a part of that, um, I'm sure some of the slides have our information on it, but uh, Abby at Lakeshore Cap keeps the list. Joe um, from St. Vincent Paul and the Warming Center He'll make sure you get on the list as well. So um, as we move forward, please consider joining us with the Housing Coalition. Um, we're really looking to make action steps and do things for our community. We're looking to educate, advocate, and facilitate change. So uh, tonight, we're really looking at um, a variety of things. Uh, just to remember that we uh, went through the Bridges Out of Poverty and the Alice in our first town hall. Um, here's some information about the Bridges Resource uh, Builder Model. Um, just the different parts on those. If you are interested in seeing some of the old presentations, meaning uh, Town Hall 1, 2, or 3, they are on the City Hall website on Facebook. They are also um, through the Housing Coalition's Facebook page, and we are YouTube famous, so you can watch those on YouTube as well. Uh, but this is a little bit of information about the causes of poverty, the community-wide approach. Joe and I really very thoroughly went through the information on here during the first Town Hall. ALICE stands for Asset Limited Income Restrained Employed. Um, constrained Employed. So that was also um, reviewed during our first Town Hall. We move on to the next slide. Um, so what were, was one of our panel members? Daryl, do you want to say hi over there? Uh, Daryl has been involved um, in many facets of the community. Um, and we lost our slide. Can I slide back? Look at me. I didn't print it out. I'm unprepared. Don't judge me. Um, <laughs> has been involved in the social service advocate for showing, I know Daryl, um, for nearly all aspects. He previously led the Salvation Army in their fight against hunger and homelessness. Currently, Daryl serves as the executive director of the Consumer Credit Counseling Services. Consumer Credit Counseling Services is a HUD-approved financial counseling agency. Their mission is to help individuals and families in Wisconsin and in Minnesota communities achieve financial stability to improve their quality of life. Financial stress can make you feel alone, but through our education, counseling, and debt management services, we will walk you through the path to financial freedom. So there actually are some questions on here that I believe Daryl is going to have great answers for tonight. He's an excellent advocate for the community, and we're really happy to have him. Thank you, Daryl. What do we have next up on our list of people? We'll see. Kate, uh, so Kate, uh, Kate Marquardt, uh, Kate serves as a supportive housing program director for Lakeshore Community Action Program and leads in the point in time, the pit count, which you may have heard of, um, where we, as well as Lakeshore, uh, co the COC, our coalition. Um, so we have that Sheboygan County Housing uh, Coalition, which is more of our local Sheboygan County base, whereas the Lakeshore Coalition serves Sheboygan, Manitowoc, Kiwani, and Door County and looks at the interests across the board. And they do a lot of things around HUD and housing. Um, so they, there's, oh, it just talks a little bit about what she's got here. Supportive housing programs, Lakeshore Community Action Program works with Wisconsin Energy Rental Assistance, where you might have heard the term WIRA, funds and permanent housing funds for individuals experiencing or at imminent risk of homelessness. Their mission is to promote economic and personal self-sufficiency and well-being of low to moderate income persons and families through service programs, advocacy, community education, and resource development in Door, Kiwani, Manitowoc, and Sheboygan counties, and to enable and empower persons, parents, and families through voluntary prevention, education, and support programs. One of the things we will get out of tonight is the fact that some of these mission statements have a lot of words in them, but there are a lot of commas. All right, let's keep going. Well, Kate, do you want to say hi? You find Kate? All right, so who's next? Scott, what do we got? 
Chaz, I mean Chad, Pelashek. Chad is the Director of Planning and Development for the City of Sheboygan. In this role, he has been a uh, proponent of affordable housing and is at the forefront of spearheading initiatives to provide equitable housing opportunities for community members. Chad has also worked within education in initiatives, participating in the city's affordable housing study, landlord trainings, and partnering with local businesses. Uh, Chad has been a part of our panel. Um, he last time came to us from Wisconsin Dells. He, did forego the water slides in order to come and present to you all. Um, and we were really lucky and happy to have him here. He's got a lot of knowledge and information and he's got a lot to share tonight. Apparently there are only two questions on the list he can't answer, so you're gonna hear a lot of chat tonight. Who else do we have? Brian, uh, ooh, Brian, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna murder your last name. Okay, it's just Brian. Just Brian is the executive director of the Sheboygan County Economic Development Corporation. Uh, he's, there he is, say hi Brian. Just Brian, like Madonna. Um, so he has been working to develop a 360 degree approach to housing solutions in Sheboygan County by partnering with both for-profit and non-profit agencies. The Sheboygan County Economic uh, Development Corp, SCEDC, that's, that's a mouthful as well. A nonprofit corporation works to build the Sheboygan County economy by providing project management and personalized solutions. We heard a lot from Brian last time as well. Um, he had a lot of great information to share with us of new initiatives and ideas that are coming forth. And just so you're aware, um, I know a bunch of people that know Brian in the community and think really wonderful things about him. So he's not just good at what he's doing, he's a good person. So that's always nice to know as well. Who else do we have? Matthew, okay, Matt, shh, he's just gonna go away by Matt. So Matt is a local landlord with mostly single home and duplex properties throughout the community. In his work, he utilizes a business approach while working with tenants to access resources when necessary. Partnership and collaboration are key components to a healthy and successful community. There's Matthew. Um, so he's also a member of the Lakeshore um, Landlord Association. Um, so um, I've heard also a lot of good things about Matt in the community as well. So I've also seen some of his properties and they're all really well taken care of and pretty amazing and sparkly shiny. So um, thank you for being here today. I think there are some really good things that you can share with the group too. So I appreciate the fact that you took the time out tonight. Do you get to, we looked at Matthew already? All right, well, Tracy. Tracy's a lifelong Sheboygan County resident. She has worn many hats in her lifetime and currently identifies as a mother, a wife, a caretaker, both personally and professionally, and a dog mom. You should see your puppy. Um, we have been so fortunate that Tracy has chosen to share her lived experiences with the community through these town halls, and she said yes to coming back here tonight. So, Tracy, that's Kate. Tracy's gotta be in there somewhere. Oh, look, 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 look. Oh, yay! <laughs> so there's Tracy for you. Uh, so she's gonna hear, be here to answer questions that you may have as well about just lived experiences and maybe some of the things that people in our community have experienced or gone through. Um, she obviously can't represent everyone, but at the same time, anyone who's um, was here during our first town hall may have some questions based on the story that she told or people have seen it since then. Um, and she was gracious enough to come here. So thank you, Tracy. And I know Tracy personally, and I think she's a fantastic human being as well. So um, thank you. And who are we missing? Did we get everybody? Oh, Mary Lynn, is she on the list? Scott's like, no. <laughs> it's like the Price is Right, where we, or, no, where we get to blame everything on the, 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 the person off screen. Um, oh, there's Mary Lynn. She's occupying her previous seat. It still has her imprint in it. We're, we're solid. <laughs> uh, Mary Lynn is a retired um, lawyer, practicing lawyer. Uh, however, she has had a long, um, passionate career helping underserved communities. So currently, Mary Lynn is spending her time running and developing the Renters Eviction Assistance Project in Sheboygan County. The Renters Eviction Assistance Project aims to mediate landlord and tenant relationships and provide legal assistance to those facing housing insecurity who otherwise may not be able to pay for legal help. So right now, she's been connected with Lakeshore Cap and access to that program has been through the Lakeshore Cap website. So anyone who's been on the Lakeshore Cap website knows how busy it is. There's a lot of resources, a lot of assistance available through the Lakeshore Cap website. It can be hard to navigate, but if you if you do go through it and you, you look for the things and opportunities, there's a lot of options and opportunities. And one of them is Mary Lynn's program. 
um, can connect you through there. So uh, that's our panel tonight. I just want to say thank you. Give them a quick round of applause for showing up. Yeah, you can tell we're a quiet bunch here. Um, I think that uh, I really wish that I'd brought my computer tonight. That was one of the things I forgot, and I was going to look and see. Does someone have extra questions and answers and keep an eye on the crowd? Do you have it? You just, as like people decide to put questions in the thing. We're, we're, we're working here. We're working here, guys. This is what happens when we all show up late. No, it's just me. Never mind. We got it. So if anything else shows up in the chat box, um, Joe is going to be the voice of the people, and he will step to the microphone, and he will, everyone's going to be speaking in the voice of Joe tonight. So anyone in the audience. If it's a lady's question, are you going to use more of a high-pitched tone? <laughs> all right. We're really rolling tonight. Okay, so we're going to, like I said, we have 19 questions to go through. The style and format that we're looking to do this evening would be that I'm going to read off the question, and the individual who feels like they have the answer for it will give it a little wave, and Scott's going to turn on their microphone, and they're going to share what they feel are the best answers to that question. In addition to that, we have other panel members that may have other things to add, share, or enhance the answers to each question, and they will then raise their hand, and we will move on through them. Um, this may spur a discussion. It may spur some questions that you didn't even know you had until some of these answers started coming forward. So please add your qu questions to the uh, chat box or wait till the end, in which case then uh, Joe will chime in. Um, and he will do his best to imitate your voice if he knows you personally. Um, I just made that up. We'll see. Okay, question one. What regulatory barriers could we remove at a local level to enable construction of affordable housing, i.e. adjusting parking minimums, minimum setbacks, minimum lot slash parcel sizes to allow for greater density and lower upfront construction costs? Who would like to start with that answer? Chad, all right. Thank you, moderator. So to answer that question, what I would say is that the um, <clears throat> the city of Sheboygan, for example, I, th I think so when we look at um, larger, older communities, typically they're, uh, in most cases, their zoning codes are pretty um, restrictive and are looking at the, you know, have addressed these minimum setbacks and lot sizes and stuff. Um, and so there's minimal regulatory barriers, I would say. Uh, for the city of Sheboygan, for example, our minimum lot size is 60 by 150. Um, we issue a lot of variances to allow reconstruction in central city housing. So if a house was to burn down and somebody wanted to rebuild that house, um, there, the setbacks come into play, but there's opportunities for variances to the ordinance to allow houses to be rebuilt. So I think you know, just to answer the question, I think we um, we feel that in the city of Sheboygan, for example, and I can't speak for all the municipalities in the uh, Sheboygan County, um, but in our community, we are a very densely platted community. We have smaller lots uh, sizes, and we're trying to maximize it. And and you know, sometimes that most of the time that can lead to. Um, better opportunity for infill housing in the central city in lower to moderate income uh, neighborhoods and you know kind of keep the price of housing down. However, current construction costs, which we really have no control over, um, are really driving a lot of challenges in today's market. Um, and you know I think the pandemic has uh, kind of increased that and from hearing from, uh, developers and uh, builders, it's very difficult to uh, plan a property and plan a new construction or renovation with the current construction costs. And frankly, I don't know who has any control over construction costs. We just hope that they'll level out at some stage and um, people will be able to continue to uh, rebuild and build properties at a more affordable price. So what I hear you saying is that there are some ways for this to occur and there's some kind of ways to go around some of the codes or adjust some of the codes as people are building or at rebuilding in some cases. Yes, there's flexibilities built in and, and we're not oblivious to those flexibilities and we understand that they, you know, that they need to happen. Um, and you know, some of them are in place for certain reasons, but um, there is the opportunity for you know, trying to facilitate uh, you know, rebuilding in, in, in central city neighborhoods. 
Thank you. Does anyone else have any pieces that they'd like to share or add or enhance that? Brian. Uh, just from a rural community perspective, so He does so the communities in the rural markets such as Sheboygan Falls um, Plymouth and Random Lake um, very definitely have nostalgic or vintage uh, type um, zoning codes to meet the minimum lot size that would be historical to like the city of Sheboygan but the bigger question is long term for downtown is really tied to adjusting the parking requirements for up uh, second stories and other parts of the community. Chad, do you have any um, inf information around like when we talk about adjusting the parking rates downtown? Is that something that you would like to talk about? Sure, in the essential commercial zone. Which, sorry, in the central commercial zone, which is really what. Uh, the commercial areas within the community are. There are no parking minimums or maximums. Parking is waived and it's really up to the developer uh, to decide how many uh, stalls they may need for their development. So we already kind of do that in the residential neighborhoods. There's obviously minimal parking requirements, but in commercial districts and industrial districts, there are uh, parking minimums, but we always work with them and issue a lot of variances, frankly, to that to try to maximize the space that we ha have uh, versus parking, because frankly, we would like to see more people using non-motorized transportation options versus motorized. Excellent, thank you. Would anyone else like to add anything or enhance that conversation any more? No, everyone's <laughs> shaking their head. Okay, let's move on to question number two. Cars are expensive to purchase, insure, and at times crippling to maintain or repair, but are necessary for many people to get around. How can we ensure affordable housing is supported by affordable transportation, walking, biking paths, transit, rideshare, or otherwise? Cheap housing isn't valuable if it's not easy to get from that housing to your job, school, doctor, recreation, etc. Can someone speak to these concerns? Chad. So I, I would start out and then Brian can probably talk more on a countywide basis for this one. But from the city standpoint, we do operate a public transportation system. And as part of our planning efforts, we do engage discussions with the Shoreline Metro uh, Transportation Service to make sure that wherever new development is happening, that there is the opportunity to either modify uh, bus routes or to um, you know, use an existing bus route that's in place. So that is a key component of what we're trying to do. We also look at the non-motorized side of things. Um, that's a little bit more difficult, but the, through the county and some of their efforts, they've done a lot of trail connections throughout this county. Um, so, you know, that's provided another means of transportation. But I, you know, from a planning standpoint, that's you know, a well-rounded planning plan is to look at all options and make sure that we're not precluding people from participating based on where they live. Mary Lynn? Thanks. Um, I would uh, also add in, at least the last time I looked, um, uh, there is a reduced uh, b uh, bus fare for low-income people, and it, that information may not be widely available, but um, when you think about living in a big city, buses are where it's at. Um, if you're in a really big city, you've got a subway, but uh, in, uh, in bigger cities, uh, traveling by bus is just fine, and uh, I think we have a very, people say, oh, the buses aren't used. That's not true. Um, the last time I looked, at, there were over 350,000 um, uh, individual rides uh, taken uh, in a typical year uh, in, the, uh, in, in Sheboygan. So it is, um, we, I think we have a good system. It's limited because everything is limited these days. Uh, but I think it's something that, uh, the more we can make people aware of it, the better it is. How do you, do you have any idea how to, to come about the reduced fare that you were talking about? Is, do you need to go to the transit office? Or? Um, I believe you need to go to the transit office. Um, I had a client uh, who I assisted in this process. 
um, and there is an application. That is some time ago, and it may have been more streamlined um, or uh, done online. I've, I've, Although for low-income folks, that can be just as difficult. But yeah, I think there. So it's either calling or going to the transfer point, the main bus where the buses transfer across from City Hall. There's staff there during the day, and I, they can help with that. Excellent. Brian, did you have anything to add to that? <laughs> All right. Uh, anyone else have any pieces of that they'd like to discuss? I know that a couple of years ago there was a lot of bike lanes put in throughout the city of Sheboygan to allow people a non-motorized transportation access to the streets. Um, you can still see the lines where those were put in place. So, um, you know, that is another thing that the city of Sheboygan uh, put, put together for non-motorized transportation. The other thing I would say is uh, some people like them, some people hate them, but last year was the first year of the scooter program, the bird scooter program, the, which will be coming back at the end of this month again. Um, but it, you know, we, for a community, we had 300 bikes last year. Uh, they were used over 55,000 miles, which was the largest municipality in the state of Wisconsin. Um, so in comparison, the city of Appleton, which is, about 15,000, 20,000 more than us. Um, they had about 300 bikes and only had about 33,000 miles. So uh, people are, and when you look at the heat map of where these, these things end up, they're all over the community. So people are using them, not only tourists for recreational uses, but for transportation uses to get around the community, get to their jobs, use them as alternate forms of transportation. So they really, you know, we just have to learn that they're, they're there, some people have a nuisance of them and keep them off the sidewalks, yes, but um, they are proving to be a alternate form of transportation. And when we look at that too, there's safety considerations. I think that because it looks so much like a child's scooter, there isn't that reality that there needs to be a level of safety with those, that that is, they do go almost as fast as a car. So you really wanna be safe while using those and, and make good choices. Always make good choices, but I do. I do know that I know people personally who do use it to get to their to work and to home, um, post work. And I know some individuals, the youth that I'd worked with previously, they're over the age of eighteen, would use it to get to school in the morning. So um, there's a lot of uses for that. Uh, anything else anyone would like to add on that question? No, we feel solid on the transportation. Um, in what ways uh, can housing solutions in Sheboygan be more equitable? That's a the broad question. Does anyone have any thoughts or feelings on that? In what ways can housing solutions in Sheboygan be more equitable? I'm not sure how to answer that question. Um, I'll, I'll just start and then I'll look to Kate because she might have a little bit more. But I think, you know, it, the whole idea of investing in affordable housing, which we've been talking about, I think is a piece of it. Um, the existing programs and future programs that could come along as it relates to uh, implementing new home ownership programs to allow people the opportunity for down payment assistance and closing costs and kind of deal with some of those burdens. The programs that Lakeshore CAP administers through you know, rental assistance and mortgage assistance and all of that kind of helps the programs that the uh, Family Service Association and Consumer Credit Counseling does with the uh, family st financial stability and all of that, you know, it all plays into uh, helping people get on a better path to be able to find housing, whether it's rental housing or uh, permanent, like owned, owner-occupied type housing. So I'll turn it over to Kate. <laughs> That question. I'm wondering what they, what the 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 person meant by more equitable. Is it equitable between um, low, moderate um, income households? Is it equitable between equitable between um, race, ethnicity, gender, that sort of thing? So um, I think you know the city of Sheboygan has done a housing study to look at how much affordable housing um, is needed um, versus you know other types of housing um, from from a, a from my perspective at Lakeshore Community Action Program, certainly we also review um, data that would tell us across um, race, ethnicity, and gender boundaries, like who is receiving our assistance and if there's gaps in, um, in 
those types of services that we offer. Um, so I don't know if that's really an answer to the question, but um, uh, I think the first step is certainly to recognize that we do want um, housing across um, all boundaries to be fair and equitably distributed to um, low, moderate income people um, and race and ethnicity and that sort of thing. Does anyone else have any input or any information connected to that? <laughs> Do you have a landlord perspective on the end of the yet? Not to put you on the spot, like I totally put you on the spot. Yeah, I guess, you know, I, I, I kind of back to what you said about not really knowing what the question really means. Um, and I, I guess that's kind of where I sit with that is I don't really know how to answer that because I'm not sure what the question completely is, I guess. Um, As a landlord, do you feel like you choose, like, like, because there's restraints on who, who you can discriminate against in housing, and there, there's ways around that, um, you know, well, not around that necessarily, but when, when you look at that as far as equitable, that there's, there's parameters already put in place as a landlord where, where you're required to be equitable, correct? Yes. Yeah, yeah. There's, def there's definitely rules and regulations that we have to work around. Um, I, I guess... And I think most landlords do do that. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure there's a few outliers that are bad that don't, but I think for the far majority of them do. Um, for the most part, we're just trying to protect. We're trying to make an investment. We're trying to have a successful business, and we're trying to protect our property most of the time. You know, it's mm -hmm. um, you know for us, our biggest fear is you know something getting damaged or something like that. But I mean, I don't think race or anything like race or income. Well, income does have any to do with that yes so but when you became a landlord because i know you own a bunch of properties yeah. how did you learn what your rights were and what your responsibility were as a landlord is that i mean like it's obviously not like you buy a property to rent and you all of a sudden you're born with that knowledge right um yeah. how was it something that you would just seek out that information or how did that come up kind yeah. of your knowledge of what you you were required the rules and whatnot yeah absolutely so i start off with a, um i start off with only one upper lower duplex and um, got that up and running. And then shortly after that, I found the, the Landlord Association. So I started going to that. And through that, I found out about the city training, the landlord training. I did that one as well. Um, and then uh, I do the, the fair housing. When they come and talk every year, I go to that one. And um, yeah. That's... So you chose to get educated on what the rules were to be the best landlord possible. Is that what I hear you saying? Yeah, yeah, I think you have to. I mean, yeah. Yeah, you kind of have to get trained as much as you can. Excellent. Thank you. Oh, Daryl's got some questions and answers for us. Yes, I just want to respond, just kind of piggyback on, on what Matt was saying. Your, your about mic isn't on. What's that? Your mic isn't on. It has to be read. There it is. There we go. We go. You got Daryl. He's live. <laughs> I just wanted to kind of piggyback on some of the things Matt was saying about the landlord training. And as far as the, the renter side of things, uh, through the kindness and the graciousness of, of the city of Sheboygan through the Community Development Block Grant, we're able to offer rent smart classes. And it's not classes where people get together where we teach them how to beat up on their landlords. That is not the point of it. It's teaching them how to equitably work with their landlords to have an amiable relationship to understand that that is the landlord's property. There's, that's their investment, and what can we do to work with them and uh, helping the, the tenants or would-be tenants understand that that is an investment property and how can they help care for that and open the doors of, of communication. So the rent smart classes are available um, every other month, and we house them uh, in person um, at the Sheboygan Chamber of Commerce, and they can call Consumer Credit Counseling Service for more information about, about that. Um, I also participate on the... On the uh, uh, Lakeshore Landlord Association, and I, I just have to give a plug, and everyone I've met there, uh, these landlords are very concerned about their tenants. They they go above and beyond uh, to help their tenants and are very well vested in them. I'm just very impressed, and I've not seen that uh, in, in other landlord associations, so I, I do tip my hat to them. Even though that we did uh, say that the equitable question is a difficult question, which it is, um, it certainly shows just by the discussion that's going on here, just in this little question, how it can be expanded to many ways of looking at equitable 
in our community. And so I think that that really probably needs further investigation by sitting around a table and in, in groups and talking about equity and what the, does that really mean. I mean, you've all talked about different equitable types of things that go along with that. And these questions or these comments that I have to share go along with the transportation and it has to do with equitable also. So first, someone wrote, Tracy wrote, bird scooters are expensive. So I mean, no, I'm just, I'm just a messenger, by the way. Um, then Barbara wrote, these, suggestion, these suggestions, and we are talking about the transportation again, again, equitable issues that are here. These suggestions work for the young, but not senior citizens or disabled that can't get around. Again, balancing. And then Sue writes, to me, equitable means that houses, rentals, are being built for people who make less than 50,000 annually. So again, that's another. Looking at it from the perspective of the person that's looking at what the word equitable means. So. I wanted to share that. And I'll, I'll maybe have more now that I've shared some, so. Cool. That's a great interlude. Do I get, oh, here we go. That was a great interlude, Joe, thank you. I didn't hear any of the voices that you promised me, but um, but thank you for sharing those with us. Um, I, I agree, I, I, you know, I think that we've addressed some of those ideas around equitability, even around financial, and we talked about affordable housing and access to affordable housing, but I, there are a lot of different ways to look at that. The Housing Coalition is looking at um, ideas around equitability as well. Um, this next month, someone from the DEIB, the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging Housing Group for Sheboygan County is coming in to speak about what they're working on to the Housing Coalition and what some of the ideas they have for uh, around diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging in the realm of housing. So that is something that is always being addressed and looked at. Um, I think that this also could be addressed further um, as we do more town halls. The, the group has already started talking about what we're going to do for our next series. So um, as we hit specialty populations and different deep dives into some of the topics that we've already brought up, um, there is the opportunity to talk more around the DEIB um, ideas in housing. Um, does anyone else have anything to share based on Joe's comments? Go ahead, Matt. Um, one thing I was going to say is that uh, when they mentioned about housing for people with lower incomes, um, with recent re um, pay is going up, it's been much easier to get people um, qualified for apartments lately. I've really seen that, that significance, a significant uh, uptick in that. Um, for our rentals, we do a three-time multiplier for income, for rent. Uh, so you have to make, you have to make, yeah, rent can't be less than a third, or yeah, rent can't be more than a third of what you of your income. And it's been much easier to get people qualified lately. So that's good to hear too. All right, so we're going to move on to, believe it or not, question four. Um, I want to know what or where we can get housing, et cetera, to help with homeless 24 hours a day. We all need help at times. So I think the question here is around getting assistance with housing. Can you take four or five together? Because kind of the all right, we can definitely do that. We have some arms raising over there. Um, I'm going to also read question number five because it relates to question four. How can we open a day center that is available during the hours of 7 a.m. to 7 p.m.? or a center that is both a warming center and a day center. Oh, and we're going to include number 13 because you guys all have similar ideas here. What are people with children supposed to do when faced with homelessness in winter and the shelter is full, which is nearly always is? So I'm going to be honest with you. I think I might start with this one. You comfortable with me starting with this one? All right. So hi, my name is Emily Kundi, and I am a co-chair for the Housing Coalition, and I am also part, one of the, the subcommittees of the Housing Coalition is the After Hours Committee. So with the After Hours Committee, we, in Chippewa County, we've been looking at what do we do with people who are literally homeless in the middle of the night? You know, um, a couple years ago, 
There were reports that came out of Milwaukee and Green Bay that someone had frozen to death outside in both of those communities, and my heart hurt. It was really hard to look at. It was hard to hear, and I was like, not in my community. I, you know, we brought it up in the housing coalition that this was occurring elsewhere, that this is something we did not want to happen in our, our hometown. Um, the housing coalition started this conversation. It moved into the faith-based community where they really ran with it. And we're like, what can we do to build a warming center in our community? So when, when we did that, like a bunch of really great minds got together. And we, they were able to run that out of the Salvation Army's lower level the first year. It just, it wasn't the best space for that. So they looked into to their uh, congregations and community and were able to move it to another location. And it is running, f um, last year I believe it ran for a month, Joe, am I right? Uh, yeah, there were some limits to it. Joe's talking about, and it's now expanded, and it's running for a longer period of time. There's Joey's doing the arm gesture. It was only four days a week. That was my Joe impression. Do you like that? Okay, okay, okay. Um, so, you know, it's expanded to a longer period of time. It opened on December 27th, and it, and it runs through March because it's cold in March in Wisconsin. So, and they've been averaging 15 to 20 people. Joe's not really to go to the mic, but he's been averaging 15 to 20 people a night. Um, it's a place to stay. Uh, overnight, um, they, their check-in is between 7 and 7.45 p.m. Um, if you need check-in around that, th there, there is a possibility for like flexibility, but they would prefer that you come between 7 and 7.45. Um, that, that, honest, that's for individual adults. So it's, you, do you have a question around that? Go ahead, hit the microphone. Do you feel comfortable? Can you, if you speak into the mic, we should be able to hear you here. Oh, okay, so thank you very, you very much. All right. I have a sister that has been homeless, and she was found with an 80-degree body temperature. I don't believe, I think that what you're suggesting, it sounds like to me that it's just a, um, a Band-Aid on a cancer, and you have to think big picture. You can't think in and out. Seven in the morning, they are out. Seven at night, they can come in. But what do they do during the day when they have? Diarrhea or any kind of inflammation, pneumonia, yeah, you know. You have to think big and, and spend the bucks because this is a trauma. It traumatizes the community as well as the person that's suffering from <clears throat> homelessness because um, people have seen, homeless. I know one man, a businessman that said after he saw uh, the effects of homelessness on one person, specific person, he cried for the whole night. We don't want that in our community where this homelessness is, has tentacles that reach out and touch every citizen. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that story with us. Um, I understand where you're coming from in the sense that, that this is this there's there's so many pieces of this it's such a complicated issue um, you know I understand it's just a band-aid but the band-aid is better than letting it bleed everywhere you know if we can we can have something like a place for people to stay overnight that's 15 to 20 people that are not sleeping on the street tonight um, and they can welcome back tomorrow night and the next night so it's better than what we had before. It's not the best choice. It's not the only choice. It's not the only solution. It can't be the only solution, but it's one of the options that we have available is the warming center. We are fortunate enough to have a, a homeless shelter. The Salvation Army operates a homeless shelter for men, women, and families. Uh, not every community has one of those, and we are fortunate enough to have that. Their check-in, we believe, is between four and six. Someone's got to know this. Yeah. 4.30 to 6 is with their admittance time. So there's an opportunity to, to check in at the Salvation Army and stay with them. They provide case management in addition to shelter. So their, their goal really is to assist people in ending homelessness, into getting into stable, secure housing um, from the shelter. Uh, in addition to that, the After Hours Committee worked on a plan because, like I said, we were really looking at this idea of, like, sometimes people can't get into the warming center or it's not open or sometimes they're a family and they can't stay there and the Salvation Army is full. What do we do then? Like, what are our options? And we really don't want people to have to stay on the street. 
So we, we, we were fortunate enough to form a group of individuals that came together to provide an after hours plan. So we have alternatives to individuals sleeping on the street, which involves a hotel motel voucher program. There are ways in. Obviously it's a program of last resort. And do you want to talk about that, Kate? Well, well, I think I'm waiting for green. No, you're oh, I'm good. Red. Sorry, excuse red. me. Yep, sorry. I uh, no, I think um, uh, there is a, a continuum of services that are available in Sheboygan County, and certainly the warming center is sort of the first step along that line of possible housing services. So you have, um, you know, you start off with an, maybe a night by night shelter, which is what the warming center is. Um, then there's maybe a long term shelter like the Sheboygan um, or the Salvation Army shelter, more long term, you can stay there longer. Um, then Lakeshore Cap provides a variety of services for ongoing rental assistance. Um, and we work with um, uh, those experiencing homelessness to become self-sufficient so that they're able to um, uh, pay for their own hotel, or excuse me, their own um, apartment um, by the time that, that our, our work is done with them. Then there's other things like um, in Sheboygan as well, the housing authority. Um, obviously that's long-term housing assistance um, for a lifetime if, if a person qualifies for it. And then there's um, uh, low income or subsidized units available for those who are elderly or disabled or families. So in Sheboygan, there's, there's a, a continuum of services that are offered. Um, it's just it's important to make that first step um, to get involved or um, referred to or to contact one of those agencies at an access point to have um, the ability to, to, to pursue um, one of those options. So, um, you know, again, uh, absolutely the warming center. Um, that design is not to be um, sort of a long-term solution to homelessness, but it is sort of the first door you open um, and then they can um, make referrals and, and do things to, to help people become stable um, and, and find the housing that, that is best suited for them. And that, like, just to speak to that point, what we talked about the after hours program that we, we instituted through the Housing Coalition started December 12th, 16 um, units or families or individuals have utilized that service since then. And of them, I believe it was 14 have sought additional services and resources. So 14 out of the 16 that we gave a night of stay to chose to, to like, use that as a jumping point for finding services for stable, secure housing. So um, it really is a nice jumping point, a really nice way to get into that continuum. So I do understand it's difficult. Like not everybody's ready to seek that help. Not everybody knows how, but there are a lot of doors. We really talk about that idea of no wrong door. We want people to be able to access resources and services wherever they go. If they come to the table and say, I need help, we want to know where to send them. We want to be able to say, like, these are. This is how you can get this help. You went to the right place. We're gonna we're gonna help connect you to the resources that are gonna support you and get you to this next step so that you you can be stably housed. So I, I think that you know Kate's right. There's a continuum of services, and hopefully between all of us that we are weaving together enough that nobody falls through the cracks. That's the goal. Does anyone else have anything they'd like to share on that point? I guess we've got a lot of nodding tonight. All right, so um, when we talk about that, the other end of this that we did not address was daytime and like a daytime um, option. So, you know, one of the things that happens with Salvation Army, I did my internship there. Uh, we're not going to talk about how long ago that was. But with my master's in counseling, I did my internship with Salvation Army. It's always been their policy that people do need to exit during the day. Typically, the hope is that they're out finding a job or working the job that they already have. Because we do have homeless individuals in our community who are working full time and do not have housing, stable, secure housing. So the Salvation Army do ask people to leave during the day. The warming center is not open during the day. It's really been bandied around what are the options for individuals during the daytime hours. A lot of people do spend time at the library. Santino Laster is actually my co-chair for the Housing Coalition, and he works for the Mead Public Library and works with individuals through um, resource finding and, and security through the library and community liaisoning. Um, and he, a lot of people who are homeless in our community do spend time time there during the day. We also have um, an organization called The Open Door. Individuals with, I believe, mental health needs can spend some time there during the day. Um, I do believe that they are connected with the program that's providing a lunch 
option for them as well. It used to take place at the library and I believe it moved over to the open door so that individuals who need that during the day have that option as well. Um, but it had been, the, the, Chad's pointing at Kate again. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Kate, did, did you say. have something that you yeah. needed to share? <laughs> I would just interject with um, with regard to the warming center and the Salvation Army. That's a model that they are, you know, using, right? Like, mm -hmm. but that model could certainly be changed if there were need. Um, uh, if needs were identified, that certainly people need a place to go during the day, then the community could certainly um, advocate for that to happen. Um, that doesn't necessarily be, have to be the way it is. It's just one way of running um, a homeless shelter or warming center. Go ahead, Daryl. I'm somewhat removed uh, from the Salvation Army having uh, left that position several years ago, but really the, the warming center was an impetus of of a man who was filling up his tank at night when the snow was falling and wondering where were homeless individuals going to stay? Where were they going to keep warm in the evening? And he approached us and going back to the whole idea of the model, um, that was, you know, fruition came from that. And uh, I know I've had, I've heard talk, maybe Joe could talk about it more uh, with the warming center. There was some uh, initial talks of maybe doing something with the day center, with the laundry and things like that, and has anything been developed with that? Well, we, we have uh, thrown that around. We've looked at a, a place or two. Um, we certainly, um, there's, a, there's a lot of moving parts with that. Uh, obviously, you have to have the right staffing and the right uh, people, and also funding-wise. I mean, that's an important part of, of that also. So really, I mean, I, my opinion is that that need exists in Sheboygan. I agree with you totally that that, that need exists and it's something to keep on the table and to talk about as we go forward. And honestly, like as the Housing Coalition, perhaps that's a, a future conversation when we talk about action and facilitating change, that is something that as a group, maybe we need to look at moving forward as well. And if you feel passionate about it, audience, you can join us at the Housing Coalition the third Tuesday of the month. Um, so you can, you can, are you tallying how often I say that? Oh, she's, she's adding people to the list right now. Abby's over here adding people to the list. So um, we, we absolutely would, would welcome your input and your um, your action. We, we want you to come in and we want you to participate and get involved. Um, you know, help us make this change. Help us facilitate this change in our community. Uh, we do have needs in our community, and we would love for you to get involved in the action and the change steps. So I, I think that's fantastic. Uh, do you guys have more you want to share down there? I see you. All right. Are we ready to move on? All right. Um, so that was three. Okay. Question number six. Why are there many income restrictions when applying for housing? You either make too much or too little. What is the reason for this? Chad wants to answer that. I'll start out. Um, so I think a lot of it has to do with the restrictions that come with the state and federal funding. Um, so the section 40, section eight, section 42 program. So we talked about in the previous ones, the definitions of what a section eight housing is and what section 42 housing is. Um, but those are all f uh, federally funded pro uh, programs. And in order to qualify for those programs, income uh, limits come into place. So for the section 42 program, which is uh, typically where they provide a tax credit to a developer to build a property that's going to have these affordable uh, rents for 20 years. Um, and they have a minimum threshold for the income and a maximum threshold. And if you are in that area, you pay your rent based on that sliding scale, but that's a federal, um, that's a federal requirement. So if one wants to get around that, that's a good discussion to have with our state and federal legislators and talk about these challenges and keep this in the news and, and uh, you know, share your concerns with them because, you know, frankly, they're representing us in Washington and these are the things they need to hear. Mary Lynn. 
the oh you're not on yet there we go I should remember this from the old days Scott <laughs> um, the um, there are really some fairly serious policy considerations at play here uh, that uh, really extend uh, locally and at the state level and certainly at the federal level. Uh, in the late 1970s, um, there was a substantial amount of money that was made available to construct housing for low-income people. And it was through a tax credit uh, program that was uh, actually quite, quite lucrative. And so a lot of the projects that you see around town that are 40 or 50 years old um, were constructed with that money. Uh, in the early 80s, uh, that money just really, really dried up. And while money is provided, it is still far short of what we need. And people need to understand that. Um, so Chad's point about uh, talking to people who uh, control the purse strings, I think, is, is, uh, is very legitimate. One of the, <laughs> you know, the, the federal poverty guidelines, um, I remember uh, at, at a council meeting, uh, someone bragging that um, Sheboygan's, uh, only 5% of Sheboyganites were below the poverty level. Well, the poverty level, uh, even now, for one person, is $1,000 a month. That is ludicrous, absolutely ludicrous. And when you take into account, for example, in our school district, I believe the number is about 62% of our children are eligible for free and reduced lunch. At one grade school in town, 90% um, of the kids and their families are eligible for free and reduced lunch. So I'm just saying that this is not, there are, substantial income inequities that really play out so basically in the, in the housing field. Matt, I was thrilled to hear, and, and this is such a key thing, when people are actually paid more for their work, they can actually afford to rent. They can afford to buy a car. They can afford to keep the economy going. Um, and so to hear that is like, it's wonderful. Um, and that needs, and I hope will continue, so that, that, that people's income, so we don't have so many poor people, I mean, really poor people. And, and let's stop talking about income guidelines. The good thing, and, and Kate will correct me, um, is that the Wisconsin emergency rental money, the WERA money, um, those income guidelines are quite high. And um, so they reach up it to, the, to the bottom of, of middle class income. And so that money is available for folks, um, and you don't have to be desperately poor or homeless to get the money. So I think, I think those things are important, but we always need to keep in mind the big picture, which is that there are too many people in, in the country who just don't get paid enough. And be, when you don't get paid enough, bad things happen. <laughs> Hi there. Um, so and I just wanted to interject down to like the individual level, like we can talk big picture and then we would bring it down to the individual level. So Lakeshore Cap provides um, uh, rental assistance, uh, case management and rental assistance to those who are experiencing homelessness, who are literally homeless, who had been sleeping in their car, exiting a shelter, fleeing domestic violence. Those programs actually do... Um, we have different programs that do different things. But the federal program actually does not have any income restrictions. You could be making uh, $100,000 a year, um, but if you are sleeping in your car, um, and we can document it, you are eligible for, for that program. Um, and there is no ceiling to that program either. You may not always get a rental assistance benefit um, because if you're making too much and you can pay your own way, um, but you can still tap into the case management and supportive services for some of those programs. So um, grant income restrictions does come into play with some of our funding, um, but not all of it. I have a question for Chad. <laughs> Chad, this is from Martha. Chad, in your presentation from the Dells, you shared several, several affordable housing projects. Are these projects fully approved and will go forward? And if not, do you think there 
is a good likelihood that they will. So, I'm I'm culprit of starting before it's on too. Um, so the uh, unfortunately we found out today from the state of Wisconsin, the Department of Administration, that um, the ARPA American Rescue Plan Dollar Act um, funding that the state released, they did not award any funding to the city of Sheboygan. We had submitted for two affordable housing projects and for some improvements to a park in a qualified uh, census tract and we did not receive any funding out of that program so we will uh, have to go back and relook. If you recall, one of those was going to fund some um, financial issues with the uh, Partners for Community Development Affordable Housing Project at 13th and uh, Erie Avenue. It was going to fund the Commonwealth one at 14th and uh, Illinois. So now it's on the city to figure out we've got some thoughts on that. Um, I think we have some flexibilities with our American Rescue Plan dollars, but they are still applying and have are waiting for award through the affordable, um, the Section 42 WIDA tax credit program to fund the majority of those projects. So they're not, um, they're not a given yet. Um, and hopefully we'll get some funding allocations to the city uh, for affordable housing from this WIDA Section 42 program that those projects can move forward. Um, but we were sad to hear today the fact that the state did not give the city of Sheboygan anything of their $240 million uh, and affordable housing was one of their main activities. And interestingly enough, they did not fund a ton of affordable housing housing across the state either. So I'm not quite sure what the um, what that is, but we'll see where this goes from here. Chad, you keep saying speak to your legislators at the state level. Apparently this is one of those times where that could probably help. Who, what level at the state are we looking at to let them know that we have feelings about that? I would say it would be, um, <clears throat> well, the challenge is, is our state legislators that represent the city of Sheboygan are Republican and the governor is Democratic. Okay. Uh, so, you know, if you go to our legislators and you share their cons the concerns with them as they've told the city officials that, um, you know, they have no control over what the governor is doing. So uh, we have a split, you know, split line here. So I don't know that it's going to make a lot of difference going to our current um our current legislators that represent the city of Sheboygan. Thank you. That's that's sad news though. I, we're over here, you should see Nabby and my faces were actually mirroring each other when we were a little bit shocked because um, we were so hopeful for the housing project. So what you're saying though, Chad, is that those projects are not necessarily dead in the water. You're just reorganizing and refiguring out how to afford the options. Correct, and I don't know if Brian wants to talk about um, Oh, I got to wait till the next question. Anyway, <laughs> so there is some opportunities with what the Economic <laughs> Development Corporation is working on that will help in this. And the city uh, did receive $22 million out of the American Rescue Plan. And um, we had originally dedicated uh, the majority of the funding to, to two water and sewer projects. But one of the sewer projects looks like it's going to get... Uh, one, the only sewer project looks like it's going to get some FEMA federal funding, so that would leave, alleviate some um, opportunities for this council to consider rededicating funding uh, where the state didn't come through. So we're hopeful, and I think we have some opportunity to still see some success, but we just have to you know, deal, deal with the diversion in the road. Okay. So Brian, would you like me to ask the next question? Is that where we're at? All right. Um, why is housing so underfunded? It's difficult to find adequate housing that's at a reasonable price. Is that the question you're looking for, Brian? So I'll start and then Brian can just finish up. So I, it's, it's a lot of the same answer that I said in the last one where, uh, and I think uh, Mary Lynn, you know, kind of covered where we've gone since, you know, their early times. So I, I think it's really, I don't, you know, the buzzword now is affordable housing and funding it, but with current construction costs, as I've talked about in my previous presentation and the, uh, the rents that we're trying to fill, you know, issues in the community, I, there's, there's just challenges. And I think, you know, again, this is where 
Um, maybe not our state legislators, but our federal legislators need to hear that everybody, that we're all concerned about this and, you know, we need help and they need to be equitable when they're dispersing uh, funding to communities. I know there's a lot of requests and, and opportunities out there, but, um, you know, Sheboygan County clearly has a dedicated problem and the city, you know, Recently, you know, we released a affordable housing market study last March, so we've got good data that shows that there is a demand. We've got 3,500 jobs open in this county. Um, so there's a lot of challenges that need to be met, and, you know, I think this is the time we're connecting with our legislators and connecting with our friends in our local private sector, and with that, I'll turn it over to Brian. <laughs> as far as with housing and being underfunded, it really goes back, and this goes back to my presentation last uh, uh, town hall is since the Great Recession, there, um, just a lack of housing has been built um, because of all the financial challenges. So the this is a national issue, and trying to get entry level homes with the construction prices that are going on right now is very difficult. Um, and that, since we do have so many open positions, uh, the SEDC, which we're about uh, removing barriers to employment, but also to growth. Um, so tonight uh, we'll announce uh, that uh, the SDC with several uh, of our partners have created a um, pool of dollars uh, at $8 million uh, to go toward finding property, infill development, and or new construction to fill the um, entry level home market uh, as well as affordable homes and trying to fill gaps where um, our legislators are not uh, being proactive uh, in um, making housing projects move forward. Um, this is not, uh, our, we're at 8 million uh, right now. Our goal is to get to 16 million. Um, so tomorrow morning uh, on Friday, we will be uh, sending out that press release, but we announced that to the county board today. Um, as far as the recommendations for ARPA at the county level, there is a recommendation to use around $3 million of county ARPA dollars uh, for this type of flexible funding. Um, most of, uh, we'll have some flexibility between um, the income levels. Um, so our, as a nonprofit, I want to stress that the fund that we're, uh, uh, or the pool that we've created, there is no profit uh, coming back to the SCDC. What we're trying to do is come up with strategies that um, bring the prices of homes down to affordability that if you're between 20, uh, 15 and $25 an hour, that you're gonna be able to find a way to uh, get into a house. Um, and so that is with the current construction uh, challenges and material costs, that is, uh, we're gonna have to look at different models and potentially create some new ones uh, in order to um, really collaborate across all organizations and communities. Um, so over the next um, three, four months, you'll hear different things coming from the Economic Development Corporation on how we are trying to drive uh, some affordability or entry-level home solutions, uh, but also we want to partner uh, with developers and or municipalities and filling gaps um, so that we pr can bring projects to market. Um, because um, our goal with this um, pool of dollars would be around 600 housing units over the next three to five years. Um, and that um, sounds like a lot, but that is um, a small, small number of what we actually need in the marketplace. What we're trying to do is reopen the entry level home market, which has disappeared since the Great Recession. Um, and once uh, contractors can see it can be done uh, with the reduced lot sizes and other things that uh, we need to partner with municipalities, hopefully we can uh, get that market to function normally. Uh, the housing market in Sheboygan County this last summer, I think if you've watched real estate at all, there was a 10 day supply of houses. Um, so tip from when a house went on the market, 10 days later it's sold for anything under $250,000. Uh, and that is not affordable to everybody in the county. 
So the reality is, is uh, we do not have enough housing units to uh, fill the positions that we need. And over the next decade, with the retiring of uh, the baby boom generation, we're going to need uh, to really up the house, number of housing units going in in Sheboygan County. So part of our role is to make sure that we identify sites throughout the county, but then partner with municipalities to make sure that they come in at a price point uh, that is affordable to the general population. Go ahead, Kate. Um, so I get you guys are big picture stuff. <laughs> I'm like small individual person <laughs> with regard to like apartment units and things. And um, with our funding, we have to look at a, a measurement called fair market rent. And what I can tell you is that as um, uh, incomes increase, so do the rental prices, right? As a landlord, people can afford more, um, which has put um, many of our clients out of being even able to afford local rental properties. And so fair market rent is the sort of number that HUD gives us that we have to find units below to provide assistance to those um, who are using our services. And that too is just kind of a, another whole issue um, locally that we've seen as a result of the, the pandemic. So again, big picture stuff for homeowners and low income units. But again, right now we're seeing that it's very difficult for our clients to be able to find um, affordable units. And if you're interested in more information about fair market rent, you can watch one of our previous town halls and it will explain what fair market rent is. So just a teaser there, Kate. Um, so does anyone else like to have any discussion around question number seven? Why are we so underfunded? feel solid on that? All right, question number eight. What are we doing as a community to help those who have little to no documentation in, in meeting their housing needs? So um, this is something that uh, we've discussed in a couple different ways. Um, and, and the group here kind of had some questions around it, but basically when you're working with individuals who don't have any documentation and it's very difficult for them to find housing, whether they, they don't have it because they don't have it or because there they're just is a lack of documentation. Kate, you, you had ideas around that? Go ahead, Kate. Sure, so um, uh, again, when you're receiving assistance through us, we are, um, required is a strong word, um, but we are asked to get IDs and social security cards of our clients. If they don't have it, that's okay. We're not going to deny someone um, a housing assistance program because they cannot provide um, a social security number or an ID at that time. Um, if they can get it later, fantastic. If they can't, that's okay. We're a nonprofit, so we can skirt around some of the, um, so the, the uh, uh, rules with regard to um, social security numbers and that sort of thing. Um, with our WIRA program, um, uh, the first step in that uh, program is to apply for energy assistance. Energy assistance does require social security numbers, so someone who does not have that would be denied that program, but the Wisconsin Emergency Rental Assistance can still assist people um, who cannot provide a social security number with rental assistance. So we don't want um, uh, lack of appropriate documentation to be a barrier to help. Thank you. One of the things that we had talked about previously in the work that I have done is that it's difficult to obtain documentation even if you are a legal resident of Wisconsin. If you don't have your birth certificate, social security card, and your state ID or driver's license, it's hard to get any of the other documents. So it's really a catch-22 situation. If you don't have your birth certificate, you can't get your social security card. If you don't have your social security card, you can't get your birth certificate. If you can't get your, if you don't have those documents, you can't get your ID. If you don't have your ID, you can't get the other documents. It ends up being like what all wrong doors, essentially. When we talk about the no wrong door system, it's all wrong doors. It's very difficult. If you're born in Sheboygan County, you can can pick up a birth certificate, um, but you need an ID to pick up a birth certificate. But fortunately, um, there, there's other people in your life or in your family. Um, if you have a parent or guardian, they can pick up the birth certificate for you. It does cost money. Um, I believe it's $20 for a birth certificate from the Vital Records Office. The birth certificate help you get some of your other documentation which um, would need your social security card. The other problem that people are having is the social security office has been closed because of COVID, so then you have to make a phone call. That phone call is no less than 45 minutes. Um, that would actually be a short phone call with them. Um, so you get to hear the beautiful hold music, and then they tell you they can't help you because you don't have the other form 
forms of ID to get the social security card. So it ends up being just a circular conversation. Um, in my work with youth in the past, uh, runaway homeless, unaccompanied minors, and whatnot, when they have tried to get their documentation, it's been the runaround. It's a very difficult cycle. So there's, there's individuals who don't have documentation because they don't have the ability to have documentation, but there's also individuals who don't have the documentation because it's so difficult to get the items that they need. So there's been a discussion of how to make those processes easier, how to help people get those items. Um, you know, we've talked with the school district, we've talked with community members on how to make those documents more accessible for those people who, who, who should have access to them. Um, and it's just a difficult process. Um, we're very fortunate that the state of Wisconsin will let you have a picture ID for voter purposes for free. So if you have your other documents, you can get a picture ID from the DMV, but you have to have those other documents to make that happen. So, um, you know, the question, like Joe had said before, there's many ways to look at this. Um, even when we look at it from this perspective, it's individuals who do not have the documentation, and there's also individuals who do not have the documentation, but those could mean two different things. So um, it, it's, it's a process, but there are people out here in the community who will assist you in getting those documents as you move forward as well um, and, and help you because um, the doors are difficult to open, but there's ways through. So um, did someone else have something they'd like to share around that point, or do we feel like we've... Go ahead, Matt. <clears throat> just one second. You're still green. We need you to go red. There you go. Um, I was just going to mention that. I don't think I've ever had anybody apply for an apartment that didn't have any documentation. And like my wife and I, we run about 50 units in town, and that's never came up as a problem. I uh, think it's because by the time they get to the point where they're actually applying for housing, they know they're going to need it. Okay. So they've gone through the process. Okay. 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 And, and, th and that may be, but I was also going to bring up that like, I, is this kind of more for people who aren't legal? Like, like the, that's the other form yeah. of not ability to get documentation. So if yeah. someone's here and, and they're undocumented. So they came to this country without the necessary documentation. That that's one way to look at it. And then there are people who are here who are legal residents of Wisconsin and still have difficulty getting their documentation that is accessible to them. I was going to bring up, you know, as a landlord, um, like I guess I care way more about their income and their ability to pay rent than their legal status. I, I guess, and I think that probably goes for almost every landlord. You know, like we're we're more worried about that. Um, that they have income and that they can pay their rent. That and they, that they're going to take care of your property. Yeah, and that, we can, and that we can find out, I guess, you know, that we have to have an ID to be able to do some kind of a background check on them. But that's mm -hmm. about it. Like, we don't even ask for Social Security numbers on, on our applications. We don't. We never have. Um, we can do our background check without it, basically. Um, that was about it. Yeah, I think when they get, when basically when individuals get to the point where they're actually filling out applications for, for a, an apartment, I think at that point they've either gone through the loophole, they have all the pieces that they need, or because mm -hmm. um, it is well known in our community that you do need a form of ID to rent an apartment. Maybe. So yeah. um, I'm glad that by the time they get to you, they've got that settled out. <laughs> yeah. So um, thank you for that information. Um, Okay, I gotta mark it off, we did that one. Is there a lot of apartments that are too expensive and vacant? And if so, what grants, opportunities, and other things does one have within optioning for housing? Okay, so basically the ones, we have a lot of what we consider luxury housing that was built recently, and they're asking if that's vacant. So those that are more of a luxury nature or they're like high-end apartments, is that currently vacant in Sheboygan County? Because there is, I'm gonna be honest with you, there is a perception that there are high income apartments that are vacant throughout the city of Sheboygan. And if if it, that is the case, it's not just a perception, but it's a reality. Um, are there options to make that more affordable or accessible? So I in, I would encourage you to re, to watch my presentation from the last town hall meeting, because in that presentation two weeks ago, I shared with, in one of the slides, the um, all of the housing uh, developments that have been built in the city of Sheboygan since 2015 and the percent occupied and almost all of them are between 90 and 100 percent occupied. So um, the ones that have opened recently, the Badger State Lofts, um, 
In the old tannery off of Indiana Avenue is 118 units. Those were all leased up before they even finished construction. So um, there is a demand there. Um, somebody is renting them, even though a lot of people say they're expensive. Um, as I stated in that presentation, you know, 50% of the units are, people are telling us that they're, uh, the landlords are telling us that their uh, tenant mix is kind of younger, middle-aged people, and the upper, the other 50%, 60% is empty nesters who are selling their houses and deciding to move into apartments because they don't want to shovel snow and cut grass anymore. So it's a, there's a lot of information in the previous town hall, and I would encourage viewers, if you have further questions, to watch that. Excellent. So misperceptions mis, mis, off is what you're saying. Yep. Yes. And I would just add that from an employer perspective, trying to recruit people into the marketplace, uh, that uh, they're having, a, even if they offer a position, they don't have, they cannot find apartments to put people in. So uh, from an employer perspective, um, the lack of available apartments is actually a deterrent uh, for relocation of um, people to try to get into the market, to fill the vacant positions that we have. So basically, there's that low vacancy rate. So even the luxury apartments are full at this point in time. Um, so people, someone is affording them. They are living there. Chad, you got more to add on that? The, the second part of that question. Kate's going to answer. <laughs> We're having a lot of fun on this. Actually. I know. He keeps pointing at you. Like every time there's a question, he's like, yeah. hey. Um, so uh, with regard to funding to um, um, you know, grants that might exist to have uh, options with housing, there they exist, right? Um, and there are probably nonprofits that are not Lakeshore Cap that uh, may be interested in pursuing some of those options. But there are, you know, there certainly is availability to, um, uh, uh, you know, purchase units and 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 provide them um, uh, for those who have, you know, lower income. But uh, that's not really my expertise at all. So let's move to the next question. <laughs> yes, I have one more thing. Oh, go ahead, Matt. I was going to say, the, the, really, the affordable housing isn't the new housing in Sheboygan, isn't it? I mean, like, the affordable housing in Sheboygan is really the existing housing. The, the upper lower duplexes, the older homes that have, have been, you know, that are they're up and running as rentals, that's really the affordable housing, not the new construction stuff. I mean, like, even Badger State Loss, which I think is like the... That's a newer, because that's supposed to be like a lower rent. Correct, that is, it's a section 42, so it's a minimum, minimum and maximum based on um, but, the, yeah. It's yes. income-based housing. If you want to know what income-based housing is, you have to watch one of our previous. You have to watch the first one. Halls. But <laughs> I, think, I think most landlords with, with uh, the, you know, the upper lower duplexes, our rents are still below that. Correct. And almost all. So really the affordable housing is existing housing, not the new housing. Correct. Right? Correct. Correct. Yeah. Yep. Good point. And just as a, to play devil's advocate here a little bit, one of the things that the community has seen and what we've seen as a housing coalition is that that th it still is the most affordable options in Sheboygan. The city of Sheboygan are those upper lowers and those apartments, yeah. but the cost for those have almost doubled in the last seven years. So you know you could rent an apartment like. Back when I rented an apartment, I spent four hundred dollars a month and had a three bedroom. You know, you're never going to find a three bedroom in Sheboygan for four hundred dollars a month. Like you're you're now talking nine hundred dollars a month. That's a that's a huge increase from what we we had before. And I do think that one of the things that you kind of said is that people are being able to afford this more now because there there has been an increase in starting pay in a lot of the, the places around Sheboygan County, which could have caused, you know, people to make more money, which means that it's it's easier to get an apartment. But there there is a different differentiation in rent. Um, seven years ago I was putting people in apartments for four hundred dollars, four fifty a month for a two bedroom. And it's almost impossible to find a, a two bedroom in Sheboygan, the city of Sheboygan right now for that rent. So, yeah, yeah, I don't think that really even exists. Um, not right now, uh, it doesn't, no. But it, know, it wasn't that long ago that it did. You know, that, yeah. that, that was pretty standard. As a landlord, like both, 
you know, our rents are kind of tied to the housing market. Mm -hmm. seems like that's kind of tied to the housing market more than other things. Mm -hmm. So, like, we try to operate with a 1% of investment coming back per month. So if you have a $100,000 house, if we, we put a $100,000 investment in buying a house, mm -hmm. we will try to get $1,000 a month off of that. Obviously, the housing market has skyrocketed quite a bit, and uh, that's why our rents have gone up. Mm -hmm. Also, the um, there's been other things that have brought rents up. You know, Absolutely. The, um, you, you know, the building materials and stuff like that. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 and I don't have a judgment or, or like a feeling about it, but it is a reality for the, the people living in the community, you know, that, that this has changed dramatically in a fairly short period of time when you look at it. The rents have gone up quite a bit. And, mm -hmm. and it, it's, I don't know that the the wages have gone with it as much as we would like sometimes. I think it's better than, it, than it's been, but you know, when we look at that, like if you watch one of our earlier town halls, um, you know, how much does it, how much do you have to make? Because you're, you're talking like a third. We Really, it's 30% is what we want, 30% of your income towards your housing expenses, not just rent, but utilities and all the pieces that come along with your housing. So when we look at that, like how much do you have to make to be able to afford an apartment in Sheboygan, you know, at this point in time? And, and we were looking at that and, certainly watch from the previous town halls to look for the math on that, but it's hard, you know, it's, sure. it's, it's difficult. So, um, you know, when we play devil's advocate, that's a piece of that. You want me to get back to the questions, Joe? There's another one in there. Okay. Who works with families to buy a home with less than perfect credit? Yes. Oh, Daryl and Kate are fighting over this one. Yes, thank you. I've got one in my wheelhouse, so uh, I think I can I can answer this uh, intelligently, or at least uh, no, I wouldn't pretend. I'll give you the, the straight facts. But um, we often receive referrals from lenders uh, to work with their clients who are very close to being able to uh, purchase a home. We know right now in Sheboygan County, inventory is obviously very low. I think uh, the last report I received, there were 62 houses available. And uh, those go quite quick, but uh, we have referrals from lenders, and they'll say, "Hey, can you work with Mr. and Mrs. Smith, or uh, to do some credit building activities?" And that's what we'll do. We'll work with them to do some credit building activities. We'll report back to the lender, and it's a, really a, an open dialogue with us working with uh, with the lenders. Unfortunately, sometimes people want are ready to to purchase a house and not quite ready. So, uh, due to some of the programming we do, opening the door to home ownership. We teach them everything they need to know to purchase a home from A through Z, including uh, maintaining that home, uh, asking them the most important question, are you ready to buy a home? And we can work with the front and back end ratios to, to get them to that point uh, to do that. But um, more than willing to work with anyone to, to bump up their credit, whether it's to buy a home or just to uh, get out of debt or be in a better financial position. Tracy, you just bought a house recently. I did. <laughs> um, so the the first place we went to, um, we didn't have a down payment. We were going to hopefully utilize a down payment assistant program, but unfortunately, they were not set up with that. So we were kind of sent on our way. We weren't even told anything about you guys or anything like that. Um, the next place we so we kind of took a year off. It was just it was a bad situation all the way around. So we kind of took a year off from looking, and then we went to a bank, and we had the credit. And I, I guess I should back up. We had the credit even when we went to this lender, but because we didn't have that down payment, they wouldn't work with us. Um, so we had a down payment, and we went to a, a different lender, a bank this time, not a, a mortgage broker, and. We were turned away because we didn't have a big enough down payment for them. I was like, what the heck? <laughs> you know? Um, so then we went to a different mortgage lender, and that person was able to, to work with us. And nowhere in there were we ever referred to you or said, we need to do, you know, you guys need to do this or that. It was, well, no, you don't have the credit, you don't have the money. But then when I called them back, okay, yeah, you do have, you know, the credit, but you don't have the money. Um, and then it was, you don't have enough money. And then the next guy, like a week later, was like, yeah, we can work with you. So it really depends on who is willing to sit down and really look at your situation and to really look at, you know, to help you. But in no way, shape, or form were we ever told 
to see you guys to see if, you know, we could do something or, you know what I mean? Like we found out about you guys after the fact, but regardless, it's, it's, um, it wasn't a good experience <laughs> at all. And then Tracy, then you had to fight the really, really strong housing market. Or yeah. Yeah. We, we closed, um, the end of April last year. So it was, it was, it was rough. Luckily, we were able to bump up our offer and, and things like that. But then again, we found somebody that was willing to work with what we had, you know, and we had a really good realtor and it fell into place. It wasn't the best adventure of your life? No, not at all. I, I don't recommend it. <laughs> it's a beautiful house, though. Yeah. Thank you. Well, we're talking about renters and we're talking about people buying homes. And uh, Barbara has a question that goes along with protecting uh, tenants from, so the question is, who would people go to in the city or the county for advocating ordinances to protect tenants paying excessive land rents in manufactured house communities? These ordinances are being enacted across the United States and in counties and cities against predatory corporations. So there's really two questions going on here. Um, many senior citizens have lost their their owned manufactured homes because of the corporations are coming in and so forth. Any any thoughts on that, anyone? Are we talking about like reverse mortgages? Um, car corporations have been known to come in to cities, and I don't know if we have that issue here in in the county or the city, but um, some large corporations come up and buy homes up, so then they're not, and then they can jack it up and, and they refix it and then they sell it for a higher price. Manufactured homes? Yes. Yeah. And, so that's and a mobile home. This is mobile homes and it has to do also with uh, uh, paying too much for renting that land on those mobile homes that are there. Is there a place where the person could go to, to do something about that? Your Legislate? older person? I don't know. No. Your older person. Your older person. I don't know. No. I, I guess I have to do a little bit more research into that because I have not heard of that a problem in trailer home parks like, you know, the ones on the south side of Sheboygan. But sure. okay. And then there, there's a there's a comment uh, from Nikki also. Habitat for Humanity Lakeside is here to work with buyers who are looking to buy a home but have credit issues. Our clients work with Daryl, job Daryl, and his team at credit uh, counseling, as well as Kate and her team at Lakeshore Cap. So, hoorah. <laughs> Yeah, Habitat for Humanity is, is a group that's not at the table today, but they do a lot of great work within Sheboygan County also. Um, and they do work with individuals within a certain income range. Um, and it's good to know that they have that that um, credit history, or credit score recovery type things to work with Daryl and um, in assistance to the other programs. So um, they were not represented here, but they do some great stuff. Brian's got some. Uh, the only thing on. I would just, uh, and I, I'm sorry, Tracy went through the whole uh, down payment uh, situation, etc. I'll just say from our, because what we're working on from affordable housing uh, strategy, we've actually been looking at all the various down payment assistance programs and how we can actually do a better job of communicating that out to potential applicants. So uh, hopefully it gets better in the future, but there's a lot of work to be done. Um, but uh, just long, long term, uh, one of the recommendations to the county uh, for ARPA would be actually a housing navigator to help uh, with uh, people going down the path of down payment assistance, how those programs would work and also working with the Federal Home Loan Bank out of Chicago on some of their down payment assistance programs as and well. Housing rehabilitation. And housing yeah. I, th I think part of the issue with the first person we went to is she had broken away from her previous mortgage person, so she wasn't completely set up. Yeah. But she also wasn't forthcoming when I called to make that appointment. And even before she ran the credit, she was not forthcoming with that information. You know, because if that was the case, we probably would have taken a step back and said, wait a minute, we need to find somebody who is because this is what we need. So I think we need more lenders in, in the community that 
I guess, are, are honest about what they're hooked up with right in the beginning before they run your credit, before they take you to that next step, because that's a punch in the gut. And right. like, I knew where my credit stood, so I knew where I could get that FHA loan. I just needed help with that down payment, first of all. But to be told, no. And then I called later and said, if I would have this amount of dollars today, would you approve me? Well, yes. Well, why didn't you tell me that? You know? And I'd also just uh, plug for Lakeshore Community Action Program, mm -hmm. too. So we do have a first-time homebuyers um, down payment program. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that that's available in Sheboygan. We cover right. four counties and not every... It is available in Sheboygan? Thank you. Yes, so Lakeshore Cab can help. Um, your first step in that process is always to be able to get um, funding through a lender. Right. Um, and then once that happens, then you can begin the process to get assistance through us. Well, it sounds like what Tracy's saying is the lender wouldn't even consider her because she didn't have the down payment, and you can't get the down payment assistance unless you have a lender. So we're back in that catch-22. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. We want to keep going. They all want oh, Matt, go ahead. Hang on one second. You, we need you to go red. There you go. Oh, now you're back off again. Um, going back to that question from before about uh, the manufactured home with somebody coming in from, from out of the community and buying that area, um, we are definitely seeing that as landlords with people coming from out of the, our community trying to buy houses locally. Like, um, I get calls almost every day from people out of the state trying to buy properties. Um, and it's definitely pushing the the housing market up higher, which is then pushing rents up higher. And some is definitely affecting our community right now. So so you see it as a real issue in Sheboygan County that maybe is a little bit more under the surface? Yeah, for sure. Like um, like like I said before, like every single day I'm getting a phone call from some people from Chicago or people from California trying to buy housing here to, to rent out as rentals. And so that's gonna be pushing our market up higher it's also, I would question, uh, with more the landlords being not local mm -hmm. like they are now, I, I would question the quality of housing that they're going to provide. You know, as far as upkeep and maintenance? Yeah, I, I, would just, yeah. I, I think that the, the landlord that sees this property is going to care about this property a lot more than somebody from Chicago or California, which there's a huge uptick in, in them buying property here. So that doesn't sound to me like something that we can necessarily stop from occurring. I think the question that Joe presented included ordinances around preventing that from occurring. Is the city of Sheboygan or the county have anything that runs that would make sense for that? Does anyone know of any legislator? Like it sounds like someone had an idea that this, this occurred elsewhere and there were possible... It sounds like a rent control thing. A rent control issue? Yeah. This was rent... You're talking purchasing homes and taking over those from outside the corporations. And that actually is happening. Joe's talking to no one over there. He's coming to the podium. You're, you're, what, there, Joe, there's two coming. issues here. There's the rental issue that has to be rent controlled and not over exorbitant for the person that was asking that question. But there's also a real issue across the United States which has to do with corporations coming in, what Matt was talking about. And it's kind of, it sounds like it's a little under the rug right now here. They're coming in through landlords trying to buy that and that, but you have to be careful of that because they're outside and they have different interests than what isn't Sheboygan interest. So I, I think that if that's an issue, it should be looked at. And when, when, when local landlords are going to buy, buy properties right now, we're competing against outside investors way more than we ever used to. You know, like, um, I, I put an offer on a house uh, this week. I, I went uh, $6,000 over asking um, on a house that needed a ton of rehab. And um, I, I didn't even get a counter offer back on it. I ended up talking to somebody else who went like $12,000 over on it and still didn't get anything countered on it. And I would almost guarantee the person who actually bought that is somebody from out of, out of our community. Yeah. Yeah. And like I think like most of the new construction stuff is, most of those ownership isn't in our community either, correct? I mean, it's, and I understand it's hard to find 
it might they're, be hard. They're to find. not, but there's opportunity for local developers to develop housing. So if you want, want to invest, you know, 12, 13 million into it, come and talk to us and we're willing to work with you. He, he was, he, Matt was on board until you said 12 to 13 million. <laughs> Perfect. No, I am. We'll meet tomorrow. Here? Matt's over oh. here. Matt, Chad, okay. Chad, man. Well, like, I, I've reached out to the city a couple times about trying to develop a little bit, and I've gotten um, very hard responses from from this from the city or from especially zoning. Um, I, I own some land on the south side that I wanted to turn into to possibly do putting in new duplexes, mm -hmm. and when I tried to contact the zoning, the, the guy basically didn't want to talk to me. Well, um, give me a call and let's talk about it. Okay, I'll talk to you after this then. And I've, I've had this on other, other um, where I've looked at properties that were um, uh, commercial storefronts that had sat vacant for a long time, and I want to turn into housing and the same thing. Well, that's a little bit, yeah, that's a little different situation. But, but maybe, maybe, but I, I can't get past a phone call. And like, he, like even when I call, like they, they, they don't want to talk to me after a minute or two, and it's... Give me a call. Give me a call, and we'll talk about it. Okay. We're making connections at our panel tonight, so that's good news. Thank you, Matt. I'm really glad that this is something that you feel passionate about, and I'm glad you're here tonight to talk about some of these issues, and and also to network and connect you with people who could maybe help you further some of these projects in the community. Um, Brian, did you have something you needed to share over there? Yes, my mic's not on, so there we go. There we go. Uh, the only thing I will mention is that we anticipate that uh, in the month of April uh, that the Economic Development Corporation will actually run a affordable housing uh, workshop to get more people uh, educated on how the tax credit deals work that um, we have these outside people coming in and investing in, um, because a lot of that those dollars are coming in from the tax credit selling of the tax credits and the amount of equity put into those deals is a lot lower than most people think. So what we're gonna be doing, working with the uh, Sheboygan County Home Builders Association is actually running a half day workshop on how uh, to make the numbers work so that we have more local projects, more local developers and more contractors engaged in that process. So that we, as pointed out earlier, local ownership uh, is always uh, better than uh, remote. I'm going to skip 11 and 12 and come back to them. I'm going to skip to number 14. What are the parameters of the problems Lakeshore Cap and other housing agencies have with processing requests in an efficient and timely manner? And are there solutions to that? It's a very specific question, Kate. I think that's you. Sure. Um, my hunch is that that would be um, a question directly related to our administration of the WERA, Wisconsin Emergency Rental Assistance Program. Um, it uh, and we apologize that that program has not rolled out certainly as quickly um, as it should have. Um, it comes down to really two factors. Um, one is the um, staff capacity. Um, as many jobs as there are out there, um, we have not gotten um, fully staffed. Um, we have not had um, um, qualified applicants um, uh, apply for the job and then um, additionally show up for an interview when they were um, selected for, for an interview. So that's a capacity issue on our end. Um, the other issue is the, the, the need right, that um, the, the need for that type of program um, and our inability to, to process things in a timely manner um, has just created a, a long wait list. Um, that holds true for our other supportive housing programs as well. We've had staff capacity issues um, in that program as well, and need has gone up, and um, that's essentially the issue. So we do our best, um, certainly, but um, we can only do so much. So what Kate just said is, if you think that you're qualified to support Lakeshore Cap and would like a job, there are some openings, and they'd love to have you on board. We are specifically hiring for um, staff for the, the WERA program and probably have um, maybe three openings um, and specific openings in Sheboygan. Um, so look on Indeed.com. We might be networking farther than we thought, huh? <laughs> Connecting people with jobs in our community. Um, we're going to go, I, and I'm not sure if this question was necessarily answered, but how will the ARPA dollars impact the wide spectrum of housing needs, homeless to those unable to find housing, renting and buying homes, both for affordability and workforce needs? So I feel like some of this was already answered, but if you'd like to touch on this again. Can you take uh, question 15 and question 18, because they're both related to ARPA and sure, sure. housing and then, issues? 
Number 18 would be um, our American Rescue Plan Act funds being used to address housing issues in Sheboygan County. If so, what specific areas will receive funding? So 15 and 18 are definitely connected. Thank you, Chad. So we, uh, you're, you're, oh, there we go. So related to the uh, county uh, opera housing task force, so we had a task force of 21 people met over uh, four months, uh, seven meetings. The recommendations coming out of that uh, related to housing would be, one is tied to uh, creation of more affordable housing units, entry level housing units, primarily single family, but doing a mixture of apartments as well, uh, working with the tax credit projects as well. Uh, just because try, going back to the affordability, uh, old, uh, older homes are where you're gonna get the most affordability. Tied to that component is there's a second recommendation, which is a uh, home repair uh, loan po program. Uh, so it's a revolving loan fund for housing repair. We've uh, tried to allocate enough for 35 uh, housing projects per year um, so that uh, we can uh, try to um, upgrade some of the existing housing stock. Uh, and then the third uh, component tied to uh, ARPA would be down payment assistance. Um, most of the down payment assistance programs right now are tied to 80% of the area median income. Uh, what we're proposing and using of ARPA dollars would be 80 to 120%. So if you're even above the area median income, you would have the ability to have uh, the potential for down payment assistance. Again, that missing middle uh, uh, for people that are Alice populations that were just above, uh, we're trying to get them that assistance to so that they can actually get into housing units uh, that are affordable. And the last recommendation would be tied, tied to the housing navigator. Again, trying to get pe less people going uh, through the painful process that it might be right today and uh, making sure that they leverage as many uh, state, federal resources and local resources as possible um, for the affordability. So what I heard you say is, number one, if you're interested in learning more about Alice, you can see our first town hall meeting. Um, and secondly, that, that that goal really is to make sure that people like Tracy don't have to go through the experiences that they did. Um, and if you want to learn struggles. more about the, in depth about the ARPA, watch the third town hall meeting where Brian presented it. Yeah, just watch them all. I mean, like for real, they're they're good. They're fantastic. Um, Brian, I heard there was a meeting today to talk about ARPA money or before our meeting. How did that go? So the uh, county executive committee met uh, earlier today on uh, with they had six task force, uh, and I'm not going to try to uh, list them all. Um, the county uh, originally had around $22 million available to spend uh, on um, these programs. Uh, based on uh, needs, they're down, they have spent $7 million on, on operational needs within the county. Um, so that would leave around 15, right, 15 uh, million uh, left uh, for these six task forces to look at uh, so over the next two months, the county board and the various county committees will uh, take all the recommendations uh, from child care to mental health to transportation, and said I wasn't gonna do this, uh, workforce development, um, affordable, housing. Uh, affordable housing, and uh, I think broadband, broadband thank you. Um, so that, uh, more than $15 million of requests. I, I'll just tell you the housing component, we're over 5 million uh, in requests. So um, the question will be how that process happens, but then if there's an opportunity for the city and the county to actually collaborate on any initiatives uh, with each of their ARPA dollars, uh, that's yet to be seen, but hopefully there's some uh, potential for partnerships. But again, it's a two month process at the county level uh, for any decisions on how they will allocate dollars. Thank you. Um, are there any affordable housing options being considered for the Aurora Hospital space on North Avenue once the building is removed? Chad. So the redevelopment agreement that the city of Sheboygan has with Advocate Aurora 
um, prior to the demo, prior to the start of the new construction of the hospital, um, requires that the repurposing, so it'll require the building to be completely demolished. Um, and it also requires that the zoning to be, to stay consistent with the zoning around the surrounding neighborhood, which is neighborhood residential six. Um, so it probably, um, and I will also say that that census track is the highest assessed census track in the city of Sheboygan. So I'm guessing it's probably not gonna be affordable housing. It's probably gonna be more um, workforce and up kind of housing, but it'll be in single family um, of some sort uh, versus multifamily. But at this stage, there's not enough information to really dive into the details because they have not really started the planning process. Thank you. Um, number 16 here, has Sheboygan considered any Memphis style code reforms to empower small local residential builders to build affordable missing middle housing? If you're unfamiliar, they, they give us a link at that point to, to look into it. I know, Chad, that you had looked into this a little bit. Do you want to talk about what the Memphis style code reforms are and explain how that may impact our community? Yeah, as I understand it in the little bit of research time that I had today to look into this, um, this, this is, Memphis had a lot of expansion where the uh, city annexed a lot of property to the outside and their uh, whole central city um, was neglected because they were focusing all their time on the peripheral new subdivision development more in the suburbs. Um, they had a kind of a change of thought and after a number of years saw the decline of housing in their central city as what's happened into a lot of communities. And they um, changed, they, they adopted their own ordinances that, um, are in, that are not consistent necessarily with a state building code or a state commercial code and they were able to um, allow smaller one and two family housing developers to construct housing that was six and 12 units. So um, you typically have to be a commercial contractor to uh, do those larger housing developments and this change allowed them to make it more fair, lower the price of the house of the competition and give more opportunity for different builders to build housing. Um, could something like that work in Wisconsin and in particular Sheboygan? I guess it could. This would be another reason why we'd wanna connect with our state legislators because state statute right now requires municipalities to adopt the state building code and that would have to be changed in order to allow municipalities the opportunity to generate their own code and enforce their own code um, versus adopting what the state adopts. So what you're saying is that, unfortunately, the, even if this was something that could work here locally, we can't utilize those codes because we have to follow the state's decision on how, how codes are met. That is correct. The state dictates what types of codes we can do and puts requirements that we can't be more um, restrictive than what the state is and those types of things are less restrictive or whatever. So it really, the state really dedicates that, designates that as part of the state statutes and those would have to be changed in order to get away from it. I didn't have time to look and see what they do in the state of Tennessee where Memphis is. Um, maybe they do have some more flexibility that allows them to go against their state, but we do not have that flexibility. Thank you. Um, one of our newer questions was, um, are older persons aware of resources available to people in their areas and in, in those others in the community? So I don't know if anyone at the, the counter here is an older person, but Chad has some ideas around that as well. I'll refer to Mary Lynn because she's a past alderman, but um, I, what I've seen happen over my 15 years is the uh, uh, in the city planning department is we try to educate the aldermen on older persons on available resources out there, but most of the time if they don't have those resources, they'll reach out to city staff and find out what those answers are and either city staff will get back to the constituent or the older person will. So I'd be curious to know where the, the concern of this 
pro of this question came from because um, unless the elder person is not uh, answering questions, but most of them will uh, connect with city staff to try to get the answer and and move forward from there. So I would value what former older person Donahue would have to say. I um, uh, Chad, I, I mean, I think you just you know pretty much hit it on the head. When uh, people are elected to office, we expect them to take constituent calls to answer them and to try to find out the best information they can. In the nine years that I was an alder, I found that, uh, number one, you get a lot of constituent calls. Number two, most of them are pretty interesting. Uh, number three, a good share of them are solvable. Uh, There's some that just aren't. But, um, and my, my resources, just as Chad pointed out, is to go to city staff and uh, find, out, find out the answer or, or connect the constituent with the person in the department that could solve the problem. So police department, uh, DPW were typically the, the two most often um, places where you needed to make those connections. So when you are listening to alder forums or whatever, that's something you can ask the candidates. In addition to that, if we're looking at more like housing related resources, not necessarily code or Department of Public Works questions, um, the Mental Health America has a really handy re resource guide on their website. Um, you can go to mhasheboygan.org and they, you can look up anything. You know, you can find resources on just about anything in Sheboygan County um, online. They used to make paper books of those. Um, I think that they've mostly gone away with that because resources changed so pretty pretty often but if you're looking for information around something that you you maybe need a resource for that's a really good place to start um, in addition to that united way has 211 and you can call 211 and they have a whole slew of resources available um, at their disposal that they can give you you just press 211 on your phone and you'll end up with someone from united way to support you through those resources as well so if your older person doesn't have the answers that you need or the older person are, are, are in this this town hall and they're looking for more places to find resources and information those are two of like your go-to's 211 and the mha um, sheboygan.org resource guide um, for any non-public related issues. Right, although typically your alder is going to be focusing on city issues, but those are excellent resources. Yeah, you never know what you're going to get with those interesting calls, though. Yeah. <laughs> so um, any number of things. So um, the, really, honestly, at this point in time, we have two, cla uh, two questions left. And I believe Mary Lynn's going to probably be able to answer both of these. So I'm glad your mic's still on, just so we're clear. Okay. Um, how do legal evictions work? And I'm actually going to stick the next question right with this, which is what can be done to change the process of terminating a per person's tenancy without cause? And it seems unjust to give someone 28 days to find a place, pack, and secure funds to relocate in such a short time frame. So both of those, I think, are fairly connected. And I, Mary Lynn, I know that you have a lot of answers to that. Yeah. Uh, and I'm going to try to be quick. I know we're kind of over our time limit here. Um, I will tell you that the legal eviction process is somewhat complex, and there's simply no way I can go through that right now. Um, and uh, we rely on, on good landlords like Matt to uh, be informed and know what has to happen. That being said, um, there are a lot of landlords who just aren't acquainted with what you need to do to terminate a tenancy. So I'm going to just focus on three things. One, a legal eviction not illegal, a legal eviction, uh, must start with a written notice to the tenant. The, the timing of that notice and what's in the notice uh, depends on whether it's a month-to-month -month tenancy or um, uh, a tenancy for a period of a year or less. Um, but there does have to be that written notice. The landlord can't come and say, June, it's time for you to move out. Uh, I want you gone in 14 days. Can't do that. Number two, the tenant actually has to get the notice. So it has to be properly served. And that can be somewhat complex, um, uh, but uh, step one and step two. And the third thing is, and this is where I think people, uh, tenants in particular, number one, are frightened, and number two, just maybe not informed. A, t a landlord has to go to court to get a tenant evicted. 
There is no self-help eviction in the state of Wisconsin. And that is done by filing a small claims action, uh, and there's a process to that. If the landlord gets a judgment of eviction, where the judge signs an order saying, you know, June, you need to move out, um, the landlord can't just go and start moving people out. The landlord has to get from the court something called a writ of restitution, and the sheriff is involved with the service of that writ in order to move people out. It is a grim, unhappy process, uh, both for the landlord and the tenant, but self-help eviction, moving tenants' property out on the street, those kinds of things that sometimes landlords say that make people so frightened are just simply not legal. Now, that ties me into uh, the second question is, do I need to get notice of why my uh, tenancy is being terminated if I have a 28-day or you know month-to-month uh, tenancy without a written lease? And the answer is the state law does not require a, a, a reason given in, in those circumstances. For five-day or 14-day notices, yes. And again, I don't want to get into the weeds here because it is a complex process. But the law would have to be changed to say you, know, you have to give uh, reasons in 28, a 28-day notice um, uh, kind of situations. There is federally subsidized housing that Chad has alluded to. Uh, there's Section 8 voucher programs. Um, the, the Public Housing Authority, plus their heart, and Joe Rupnick, who is magnificent. Um, there, are, there are federal uh, rules and requirements that lawyers love. I mean, I'm, I'm looking for technical defenses, you know. <laughs> I'll, I'll use what I can get. But uh, generally, in a 28-day, month-to-month kind of tenancy, there's no requirement at all. Um, what I say to people is the landlord if he's properly served the notice, you have 28 days. If you aren't out at the end of that 28-day period, the landlord must then file a small claims action to have you evicted. And that process, it depends, can take 10 days to three weeks, depending on where you are and, and what the court dates are and, and whether you appear as a tenant and contest or, or whatever. So you get a little bit. The problem is, and I'm just going to say, um, that a judgment of eviction or even an eviction action that has been started and is then dismissed is a true scarlet letter of our day. I, given the extremely tight housing situation that we have, given the fact that people don't have a lot of money, and then they have an eviction, even if it's dismissed, it is an, it's an untenable situation. It's really, it's just very, very, very difficult. This leads me, and then I'll be, because I know I'm going on here. Um, when I started as a legal services lawyer many years ago, um, I became very involved in housing law right from the jump, and I helped organize uh, 17 tenant groups around northeastern Wisconsin in the, in the time that I was doing that work. People, individual tenants, feel and usually are pretty powerless. And that's just a fact of life, and it's just something that we have to deal with. Um, I was excited by the possibility in, uh, almost a year ago with the Wisconsin, with the WIRA money, um, that lawyers could get involved in tenancy and terminations and evictions and actually have a tool. You see, because when you have, it's like being a defense lawyer. I mean, you know, you often don't have very many tools to work with. Well, if I can say to a landlord, we can actually get you rent. We can get you back rent. We can get you forward rent. Um, that gives us a tool. So we started something called the renters, and I'm just going to make a pitch for this. The renters, uh, eviction Assistance Project, REAP, and we work through Lakeshore Cap. It is a true partnership. When people call into Lakeshore Cap and say, I'm being evicted, I need rent, in that intake process, those cases get referred to us. When I say us, I have a, a colleague, she and I, basically with the assistance of a couple of pro bono corporate lawyers, 
Um, we'll contact clients and see what we can work out. Um, and uh, since the end of August is when we started, we have uh, uh, worked with uh, almost 60 different tenants. And so it's been really fun. And for me, <laughs> for me, I get to go back into court, which I haven't done for many years. And I have actually had some victories. Whoa. <laughs> I, you know, it's like, hmm, uh, you know, maybe, maybe I could get back into this. Um, and, uh, but we also have, <laughs> we also have, uh, uh, Attorney Stadolka and I have just dealt with some of the most tragic, unbelievable, heartbreaking situations. Um, thankfully, Lakeshore Cap provides hotel rooms at, at mostly, I think, in Choi and at La Quinta Inn. Um, but people who are, literally have no place to go and, it, and with families. And it's, it's really terrible. And I'm just going to get, I called the small claims clerk today and I got these numbers. In 2021, there were 256 um, eviction actions. So that's about 20 more or less per month. To date, to the, the beginning of, to the beginning of March, there have been 70. So that's about 35 evictions. You'll remember there was a moratorium that was in effect that I think really did, wasn't universally effective, but it really helped. Um, so the pace is picking up. The ARPA or the WIRA money is still there. Um, refer your clients or the people you know and care about or who are having a hard time to Lakeshore Cap, not only for financial assistance, but if there are legal things that we can do, we're enjoying it. Well, not enjoying it. You know what I mean. We are. We feel enjoying like enjoying being able to help. There you go. There we Thank go. Thank you. Um, so that's it in a nutshell. Um, and it's uh, you know the the connection would be Lakeshore Cap, and uh, so I hope that's been helpful. Thank you, Mary Lynn. Um, we, we didn't think we were going to last an hour tonight with the questions that we had. We're now at 7.30. Joe, did you hit all the questions that came in the chat? Are we missing anybody? Um, I know we're running over time. We appreciate the fact that you're sticking with us. There's just so much good information. Go ahead, Joe. Just uh, Martha says, thanks to all for, uh, of, thank, thanks to all of you for your time and efforts in support of access to affordable housing in Sheboygan. This series has been very informative and interesting. Thank you, Martha. Um, I do want to thank everybody in the panel tonight who's taken time out of their day to come here and present this information to our community um, and also who attended and participated in all of our town halls. We really appreciate um, everybody in our community and everyone on this panel for all of the great information that they presented this evening. So from the Schwinn County Housing Coalition, thank you so much. We really appreciate you. Um, and I wish you all a great night.